159. It's Wednesday night and we're talking about something that is very controversial to people. We do not believe in water baptism. I've written two statements up on the board here and I wrote one over here because I'm going to address this and this. You cannot baptize yourself. A human being cannot baptize you. Baptize, I've said this so many times, I really want to get this over to you. Baptize comes from two words, baptizo and babto. You will find this in your Strong's Concordance. Baptizo means to cover. And then it'll tell you, see babto, and it will say to stain and to die. I'm wanting to show you why you cannot baptize yourself and a human being can't baptize you. Because baptize was originally an infinitive. Being an infinitive, that's called a verbal noun. Mr. Strong will say that in his, in his encyclopedias. He'll tell you that. It's a verbal noun. I know that's an infinitive. It's a noun with verbal character behind it. What this means, this means that you are standing here. You hear with ears to hear. Your ears are protruding out here. And you got ears to hear, the hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord has made them both of them. In infinitive shows, there's this fluid coming from an outer source, and it covers the person, and it stains him, and dyes him with the blood of Christ. He's washed us from our sins and his own blood. The action comes from God. And the Holy Spirit does the baptizing on us. We hear the truth, hear the truth, and when we hear it, we come alive because the Holy Spirit does the baptizing. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It is a Holy Spirit baptism. A blood baptism was the same thing. The Holy Spirit is truth, and thy word is truth. So a word baptism is the same thing as a truth baptism. It's the same thing as a Holy Spirit baptism. It's the same thing as a blood baptism. A blood baptism, by definition, according to the scholars, was a death. You can't put yourself to death and seek God because there's none that seeketh after God. So you won't die if God leaves it up to you. It is not according to your will. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God shows mercy. So if you are baptized, it has to be by the Holy Spirit, not by you, not by some preacher. You have to be baptized, not by yourself, and not by a human being. You can't be, according to the Bible. And the one baptism is blood, it's Holy Spirit, it is truth. It's the Word of God. Now, I have another statement up here on the board. I, let, let me show you something before I leave this subject. I'm not going to leave it because I'm going to hold on to it. Go back over here to Hebrews. Go to Hebrews. I meant to bring this out last week. I just didn't do it. I'm sorry. Now, Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the Bible says here, Ninth chapter. All right. In chapter, wait, I'm in chapter 7. That won't work. Okay. In the ninth chapter, the Bible says, speaking of when Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Testament is the word diatheke. It means last will and testament.
Last will and testament is what it means. That's the word testament. It's also the word covenant. When people try to say covenant and testament are not the same thing, well, that's right, but they're the exact same word in the New Testament every time you find both of them. Then he says here in verse 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. In other words, when Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, he has to be dead before that cup can take effect. And that doesn't take effect till later that next day, what we would call the next day. It was the same day to them since their day began at 6 o'clock and ended at 6 o'clock. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Jesus is saying, I want all you apostles to drink the cup after they nailed me to the cross because they blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, the ones written on tables of stone, not the one written on fleshy tables of the heart. A testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Let's read verse 19 now. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with hyssop and sprinkled the book and the people. Sprinkle means to asperse and spread it out over the people, not upon, not water, saying, this is the blood of the testament. Now, that's what Moses was saying, which God hath enjoined unto you. And let's go back and see where Moses said that. This will show you that it was blood from the beginning and that it was not water. That was a proselyte washing. Let's go back to Exodus the thirty-fourth chap, the twenty-fourth chapter, Exodus. Here's the original baptism. Exodus twenty-four, and they are in the wilderness. Twenty-four, and let's start reading in verse three. We've got to read this to see what the real, real baptism is. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, will we do? That's the same thing as saying amen. So be it. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning, building an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he said, Young men of the children of Israel, which burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings and oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, here is true baptism, and sprinkled it on the people. That is a picture of Christ washing us from our sins in his own blood in that seventh chapter of Revelation. And said, Behold the blood of the covenant. That's exactly what he repeats over here. This is the blood of the testament in verse 20 of chapter 9 of Hebrews. Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So let's read on down. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, that's the two sons that God killed, offering strange fire, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, paved work of sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in his cleanness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand also they saw God and did eat and drink. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, and that thou mayest teach them. And those were kept inside the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled with the blood on the Day of Atonement with the blood of a goat. Now, I want us to... There's something that has really bothered me this last week. I, I had on a T-shirt, and I had a portion of 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We are bound to give thanks always to God of you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Well, I was trying to shorten this so I could say what I wanted to say, and I put on the T-shirt, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And I walked out of a drugstore down here, and a lady said, I like your shirt. What really hit me, she thinks that I was saying, God has chosen you and me and everybody else uh, unto salvation, except I didn't have through sanctification of the Spirit. I didn't have room enough for the guy that made the shirt to do that. And I got to thinking, she thinks that I had that on there because God's chosen everybody. He has not chosen everybody. He has only chosen a few. And I put up here the exact opposite of predestination. Predestination is the word prohorizo. Horizo, there is no H, H's in the Greek. There's what's called a diacritical mark, that little it looks like a little apostrophe of some sort, and it actually has a breathing sound, H. Horizo. Horizo is our word, the Latins later on put an N on it, it is our word horizon. Predestination does not belong to the unbeliever. Only a few people are predestinated. The Bible says in Matthew uh, 7, 13, and 14, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few will find this straight, narrow way. Few. Oligos. A puny number out of all civilization will find the straight and narrow way. You say, does that mean the Baptists and the Protestants here in America, probably very few of them believe in the straight, straight gate. <laughs> straight is the word stenos. In the Greek, you have a noun. And straight is the noun form of the word stenazo. And if you're not entering into the straight gate, it means to crowd through a narrow opening. And this word stenazo is the word groan. If you're not groaning, you're not going through the straight gate. If you're not being pressured on all sides by the world when you say predestination's true, Christmas is pagan, then you're not in the straight gate. If you don't say Hey, you have to be in the narrow way. I used to think that was a special breed of believers. That's the only thing that believers go through. You have to be in the straight. When you go down to one of these big Baptist churches and they're preaching this easy, slushy gospel, an easy Jesus walking down the aisle. Well, I walk down the aisle and I'm home free. Mary's got a distant cousin. He saw me one night years ago. He said, well, I accepted Christ the other day. I got my big house out here on the lake. I got my Cadillacs and my cars, and I ain't got to pray to God anymore for anything. I thought, gosh, you're really a fool. You are if you think that's going to get you into heaven. Accepting Christ along with all your money it won't get you anywhere. You have to be groaning, and you have to be going through the narrow way. The narrow way 
I don't believe most Baptists know anything about the narrow way. I don't believe most Church of Christ or most Charismatics or Episcopalians or Presbyterians know anything about the narrow way. Narrow is the word Thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. Thalibo is the verb form. Doesn't look like a verb, but it is. It's a verb form of the word thalipsis. And thalipsis is the word tribulation. Every time you find the word tribulation, it is the noun form of narrow. Noun form of narrow, it's to, it's you make these, it's something you are doing in the narrow way. And when you're doing the narrow way, you feel pressured from all sides and you're going through tribulation. That's the exact same word that Paul would use over and over and over again, especially when he said in Acts 14, 22, we must through much, we must, it's an imperative, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And that's when he tried to kill Paul, they stoned him and left him for dead. So only a few people, I know people think, well, that verse is talking about people outside of America. It's talking about people in the jungles of Africa, <coughs> down on the Amazon River in South America. It's talking to Baptists. It's talking to Church of Christ. It's talking to Pentecostals and Charismatics. I don't believe anybody is preaching the narrow way in America that I hear. I don't hear anybody. Maybe John MacArthur may mention it once in a while and a few other guys, but they've got a comfortable gospel where they can get along with everybody <coughs> and they don't. Now, John will go after the charismatics, but we, he won't go after the free will Southern Baptist Convention, which most of them believe in free will and accept Christ, and that's not the method of salvation. Let me clarify something. You may have walked the aisle, claimed to have accepted Christ as your Savior, Somebody wrote me a, an email and said, oh, it was uh, the fellow in Fort Worth, Bob. He said, they say you have to accept Christ as your personal Savior. What is it like to, to accept Christ as your impersonal Savior? <laughs> I don't get that. As your personal Savior. That's not in the Bible anywhere. So, I walked the aisle many times, but I was a believer walking the aisle, listening to the preacher and making and believing him, which was my father, when he said, if you don't know tonight, you may die and go to hell. I didn't want to go to hell, so I walked the aisle again. I'm going to try to accept Christ. I'll do this every time he says that until I can get Christ accepted in my heart. If you're really sincere when you walk the aisle and you really kept walking the aisle like I did, and you kept praying the sinner's prayer, oh God, save me for Jesus' sake. It don't mean you're lost. It just means that that walking the aisle had nothing to do with it and that sinner's prayer had nothing to do with it because we know that God heareth not sinners and we know that you can't accept Christ. The natural man doesn't receive decomai means to, <coughs> means to accept an offer that's been given. Dead men can accept Christ, but will you accept Christ? Yes, after you're born again by the will of God that you didn't have anything to do with. If all of a sudden you wake up one day and say, I want Jesus in my life, I want him in my heart. I told the guy that is giving me therapy this morning. I've learned the best way to talk to people is not come up and chew them out because, well, you're a Jew and you, are, you, don't, and you don't know nothing about Jesus. You don't like him, do you? I didn't tell him that. I've given him a few DVDs. I've given him some Greek words. And I looked at him this morning when I was over there for my therapy. And I said, Ben, you know, I really do like you. I hope God deals with your heart one day for you to seek the truth. It just humbled him. He went and started hanging around me and coming over and talking to me. A uh, soft, soft answer turneth away wrath. Don't tell people, if you don't believe in predestination, you're going to hell. You ever seen anybody do that? I'm afraid I may have done that some years ago. 
I, you don't talk to people that way. Show them some compassion and tenderness, and you might reach to them. Because when I told him, I said, I hope God deals with you the heart one day. I really like you. I'd like for God to deal with you. Well, that's enough said. If he, I give him several DVDs. I said, watch, watch me one of my DVDs and see what I do. Anyway, so only few people know about the narrow way and tribulation. If you're in the narrow way, you're going through tribulation for what you're saying to people. That is an absolute necessity for every believer. Now, the part that most people don't like the part they don't like is that God wants certain people to go to hell. If the, if the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made it in both of them, if God made the seeing eye, and he tells the Pharisees in the 13th chapter of Matthew, many men have desired to see this, and he said they haven't seen it and haven't heard it. And he said... You don't have any ears to hear, and you see and see not, you hear and hear not. They weren't meant to go to heaven. The Pharisees were evil men. Now, the part that a lot of people, that most people don't like about predestination, they don't mind God predestining, let's just say, some good reformers. Most of the reformers say, well, we believe in predestination. Uh, they don't go into pro horizo. We believe in it, but we don't think God sends men to hell. We think they send their own selves to hell. No, they don't. Nobody gets to go to hell by their free will. You have to go to hell by the will of God if you go. And you have to go to heaven by the will of God. I do not even see how a God could make men and have all the blood flowing through their head and give them either a tender, gentle spirit or give them a hard-nosed spirit like some of those mafia guys they show on TV. I don't see how God could make a man without making his disposition the same way. Whatever your disposition is what you're deposed to be. If you're gentle, God put it there. If you're hard, God put that there. And he's made you that way. He's put you in some gang in New York. You're born into a mafia or mob family. And did you have anything to do with that? No. Me and my brothers were raised by the same father. And he was a hard man. And me and my brothers, or as far as the east is from the west, in our beliefs about any form of truth. My younger brother is a Pentecostal charismatic. He used to MC up here at TBN or DBN, the Devil's Broadcasting Network. And Clyde was always a Southern Baptist deacon somewhere. And he just, one time I was talking to him, I said, let me talk to you about predestination. I talked to him about it for a little while. He said, you know, Jimmy, I could believe that. And his wife, Olivia, is sitting over here on the other side of him. She said, we don't believe that. And that was it. It was done. Well, a woman's not going to tell me what I'm going to believe and what I'm not going to believe. Now, let's go over here to Romans. One of my favorite verses. This woman I was telling you about, she said, that's really good. God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation. That's really good. And I said, well, I got other things I teach that people don't like. She said, like what? I said, well, it was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. Christmas is paganism. Christmas is Roman Catholicism. She said, I'm a Roman Catholic. I said, we'll take this DVD right here and watch it. I, did, I didn't blink an eye when she said, I'm a Roman Catholic. I just as soon tell a Roman Catholic the truth as a Baptist because they're so hard-headed and they're not going to listen to anything you're saying. So anyway, 
It made me realize she thought that included her. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. He was talking to the church at Thessalonica. He's talking to the believers. Wasn't talking to these vessels of wrath. Go to Romans. Romans 9. This verse came to my mind after she said that. God doesn't love everybody and he doesn't want everybody to go to heaven. If, if God wanted everybody to go to heaven, let me ask you something. Why did he make the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Why did he set that tree up and put a boundary line around it and said, don't you cross that boundary line. Don't cross the boundary and partake of that tree. Why did he do that? Why did he have a law? Why not make everybody perfect? Is he going to do that one day? Well, yeah. In heaven, he's going to give us new bodies so that we can't sin. We're not going to have fleshly bodies. I don't know what they all be. <coughs> but <coughs> he's going to give us new bodies with no sin. Why didn't he do that here in the garden? Why did he put up that law and said, don't go into that tree? Why did he make men out of corrupt dust? And that's what he did when he cast Satan into the earth he cast Satan to the earth in Revelation, the 12th chapter. And you can see that. That's a panoramic picture of all time. And if you want to know where he was cast into the earth, go look for the nature of Satan in Genesis, the first chapter. And you will find it staring you in the face there when the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Create is a righteous word. It's the word bara. It's talking about righteousness. Bara is the word create. It means to cut and make fat. The word fat is not our word fat biblically. It don't mean cellulite hanging down your side. The word fat means the richest of cattle, the richest of the land. When they have, the cattle were fat in the field, it don't mean they had too much fat on them. It meant they were the, they were the best of cattle. The crops that were fat, they were the best of crops. And that's what create means. And then the earth was or became without form, form, and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep, and the light couldn't come in. It was all over the surface. Even the scientists tell us we had at one time a cloud around the earth, and so between verses 1 and 2 has to be where Satan was cast in because you find his very nature here. And without form is the word tohu. I put this on the board many times. And Isaiah 45, 18, 45, 18, the Bible says when God created the heavens, he created nothing in vain. He created nothing in vain. In vain. So when it says created, he created nothing in vain. He's referring back to the first verse. And in vain is the word tohu referring to the second verse. I'll get it in a minute. To who? It means void, empty. 
So he didn't create in vain. Satan is cast to the earth there. He wasn't just cast in the earth. The Bible says the stars are not clean in his sight. The moon is not clean. Everything in God's creation was corrupted by Satan when he was cast in. When the Bible says there'll be new heavens and new earth, there's many types of heavens, but if, the, if it's certainly talking about the heavens above, there'll be new stars, new moons, new whatever God wants in eternity. I don't know. So God took this corrupt earth in the second chapter of Genesis, actually in the 25th verse or 26th verse of this first chapter, and made Adam, said, let us make man after our image. And he formed Adam of the dust of the ground, but the dust was corrupt. Why would God form Adam of the corrupt dust of the ground? Because he wants to redeem a people out of sin. God wants there to be sin so he can be angry at it. Now, you ever stop to think? You cannot have mercy without wrath. You can't have up without having done. I've said this so many times. If everything in the world, if all the sweeteners in the world and all the sour things in the world were sweet and there was no such thing as sour or bitter, what would you call sweet? It would have no definition. You couldn't call it sweet because... That means there'd be something sour. So you just have to call it, uh. You wouldn't have a definition. If God wants to have mercy on a people, he's got to have wrath on others. He's got to put some in hell in order to redeem some. You don't redeem or buy back somebody if, if you've never put others into hell and that's what this verse over here in Romans 9 this came to my mind as soon as this woman said this people don't like the idea that God wants people in hell he wanted sin over here he didn't say to Adam if you eat of the tree you're going to die he didn't say that he said, the day you eat, you will die because you're going to eat. You're made of corruption. There weren't six days of creation. There's six days of making and forming. Making and forming. The common word for form, when God formed Adam of the corrupt dust of the ground, is the same word as potter. It's yatsar. Yatsar. A potter molds pottery. He doesn't create the pottery, but God created the pottery out of nothing, out of his mouth. But when he created, that's not the same thing as the six days is making and forming. Evidently, he wanted sin so he could be angry at it. Who created it? Who created sin by putting a tree in the middle of the garden and putting a law there and said, Thou shalt not, and you can't keep from doing it because you're made out of corruption. Evidently, God wanted there to be something there he could be angry at. Stop and think. If he's God, if he's going to have anger, he's got to create it. He creates everything after the counsel of his own will. If he's God and he is, and there's sin, he wanted the sin to be angry at it. He didn't want the sin. The only way it can glorify him is when he overthrows it. That's what this ninth chapter, verse 22 says in Romans. Let's kind of read down to it. All right, let's read here in verse 6 of chapter 9 of Romans. No, not verse 6, excuse me. When God says in this chapter, I loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. He didn't love Esau. He hated Esau. Well, let's read that. 
Verse 9, For this is the word of promise, At this time will I come, Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived, even by one, by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, neither one of them, when they were in their mother's womb, had done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, prothesis, P-R-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. This is the word purpose. It's the word purpose nearly every time you find it. Prothesis, it means before tithema. Tithema means to lay out like a track, like a train on a track. God's got everything laid out and everything has to run on that track. That the purpose of God, what verse am I in? 11. Oh, 11, okay. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good, they did no good that could be measured against them or for them, or evil while they were in their mother's womb, that the purpose of God purpose, pro prothesis, before laid out his plan or program. According to election, eclectos, favor. Esau hadn't done any good or evil. He had done nothing wrong to be hated. But God can hate who he wants to hate. He can make evil the people he wants to make evil. But the thing is, you say, well, then if God makes us to do evil, he made us to be able to do evil, and we will do the evil. But what's he going to do if we do it, if we belong to him? Beat the living tar out of us. He's going to whip us with the scourge so that we can be partaker of his holiness. According to election, might stand not of works, Neither one of them could do anything. Not of works, but of God that calleth. It was said unto Rebekah, the elder, Esau, will serve the younger, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And, he, and Edom's, in Esau's descendants was Edom, just south of Israel. And they were always at war with each other. The elder shall serve the younger as it is written. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. People say, God don't hate anybody. We hated Esau. Hated there in the Old Testament. It's, it's written down in the Old Testament, S-A-N-E. That's the word hated in the Hebrew. He says that in Malachi, the first chapter. Uh, have not I hated, loved Jacob and hated Esau? It is pronounced sona, S-A-W-N-A-W. It looks like sane, but it's pronounced sona. He said, I hated Esau, disgust, repulsed with him before he's born. You say, well, that don't sound fair. Well, if you want fair, God will send us all to hell. This is exactly the opposite of mercy. We were all sinners. And God says, I'll have mercy on this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And it will be few. Now, the part that people don't like is God's hatred. Well, God don't hate. Are you kidding? The word love is agape in this. And this proves that God loved Jacob. Agape is one of the words that's been translated love or charity. 2 John 6 says this is love and the word is agape. Let me put it this way on the board. Agape
agape equals. This is love, 2 John 6. This is love that we walk after his commandments. Jacob's name was changed to Israel Jacob means to, it's a heel catcher, one who trips people up. That was a good name for him. Israel means to prevail with God. Prevail with God. Not, not a little G, capital G. Prevail with God. And his name was changed to Israel in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. Did God give his commandments to Israel? Well, I guess he did. Over in the book of Exodus, he comes to the mountain in the 18th chapter. He goes up on the mountain in the 19th chapter, and he comes down with the commandments of God in the 20th chapter. That's Jacob or Israel that God loved and gave him his commandments on tables of stone that we read about earlier, tables of stone. And now he's written upon the hearts of the spiritual Jew. He's written upon fleshy tables of our hearts. And if you don't have his law written on your heart, you're going to hell one day if, he never, if he's never written it on the fleshy tables of your heart. Now, let's go back to this chapter. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? That just doesn't seem right to hate one man. People say, God don't hate anybody. Well, let me, let me check this out for you. All right, let's go over here in Psalms 139. Look at Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Verse 21. 139. All right. This is David. Praises God for his all seeing providence. He's providing everything. Verse 21. This is David speaking. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies when they're your enemies. And if you're an enemy of God. You're an enemy of God if you're friends with the world. Friendship with the world there in James 4 and 4, is enmity against God. Enmity is the word E-C-H-T-H-R-A. Ekthra means hostile. God's enemies are those that are friends with the world and get along with the world. If you haven't let go of the world, one of the things God wants you to do is let go of them to run around and chase around with people. I'm not going to be buddies and pals with anybody. When I told the guy, I really like you, he's got a great personality, and I hope God deals with your heart one day to, I hope he deals with you to seek the truth. I really meant that, but I'm not going to run around with him and talk with him about the world. Now, let's read on here. That's what Paul anticipated the people saying. For he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. In other words, I do what I want to do. I'm God. Where was that quoted from? Exodus 33 and 19. Exodus 33. 33 
and 19. And this is God speaking to Moses. This is where this is quoted from in Romans, the ninth chapter. And he said, Moses in verse 18 said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God says, I will make all my goodness to pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see my face and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not see thee. Now, let's go back over here to Romans 9. So, he says, I'll have mercy on whom I want to, and I have compassion on whom I want to. Don't anybody question me. People say, well, uh, then... Why is it that God finds fault? Well, the Bible says men are going to complain about God and gripe about Him. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? You're going to tell God when he is unfair? But we have the mind of Christ. And then Isaiah 40, 12 and 13 he says these words, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or being God's counsel hath taught him? You're going to tell God what he needs to do? Then Job 21 and 22 says, Shall any teach God knowledge? You're going to tell him what's fair and what's unfair. He judges those that are high. And he keeps saying these things all through the Old Testament. He does what he wants to do. The scripture says that our God is in the heavens, there in Psalms 115.3, and he's done whatsoever he hath pleased. He does anything he wants to do. Let's go back over here to Romans 9. So, if he hates one man, loves another, that's his business. I'm not going to fight God, especially when he's convicted my heart. I'm just going to get on my face and say, Lord, thank you for calling me. Now go back over here. So then, verse 16, it is not of a man that willeth. Thelema. Thelema means to determine. Man cannot determine his ways. The Bible says there in that 16th chapter of Proverbs that man designs his own way, but it's the Lord that directs his steps. Our steps are ordered by the Lord. In fact, even our mouths, the Bible says in Psalm 16, look at Psalm 16. Not Psalm 16, Proverbs 16. Look at this. If a man says evil things, I'll tell you, well, this makes me scared to stop and think of this. Look at Psalm 16 and 1. The preparations of the heart in man, if it's a good heart or a bad heart. Paul said, um, the, the Psalm says, in Proverbs, my heart is fixed. Fixed. K-U-W-N. My heart is upright. It's been fixed by God. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. When a man answers anything, you realize how sovereign God is? He makes your mind think the things he's thinking. 
and it comes out of your mouth because God has arranged it. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. A man thinks, I'm okay. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. God has made the wicked because he wants to be glorified in their destruction. I can't figure that out. If I've said this so many times. If that door over there would open up and the hell was right through there, that door, and it says up there above the door, hell, enter. And you could open that door and you could see men screaming and yelling and in pain like you couldn't believe, would you pull them out if you could? I would. I couldn't stand to see that kind of pain. God will not. I would do a lot of things that God wouldn't do because I can't think like he thinks. He says, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. You wouldn't send somebody to hell forever. I'd just let it burn up. He said, I'll put them in there for eternity. You think, but that's a grandmother. She's not evil. Where do you come up with that? I've said this before. If there's not a just man upon the earth that goeth good and sinneth not, there's none good, and every man at his best state is altogether vanity, worthless. That includes grandmothers, little sweet people. And if they are vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, I guess one of the most evil creatures I ever saw in a movie was that alien in alien that Sigourney Weaver was fighting. They got these long jaws and saliva's dropping down and she goes boom with a space gun and everybody goes, yay, yay, she killed the bad, evil monster. That little grandmother's more evil than that monster and the alien. There's nothing righteous in her. And anything that God wants to give her, unless he births somebody and puts righteousness in them, they deserve everything. And so did you, such were some of you. So did we. We deserve the worst of the worst. So he makes all things for himself, yea, even the wicked, for the day of evil. Let me keep reading. Everyone that is proud in heart stinks to the Lord. It's an abomination to the Lord. Though hand, join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. The reason I wanted to get away from the evil when I was young is because I fear God now. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. When a man's way pleased the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with them. You don't have to scream and yell at people. You don't have to say, well, predestination is true and Christmas is pagan. You don't believe that, you're probably going to hell. You don't need to be doing that. Be gentle and kind to them, but be firm. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Solomon put it that way in Ecclesiastes. He says, he says better is a handful with peace with God than more than you can handle without the peace with God. Then he says, A man deviseth his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You may be saying, Lord, I'm going this way. And he says, No, you're not. You're going this way. And he'll do, he'll manipulate your life, things in your life to make you go the direction that you didn't intend to go. He made you do that. He made you listen to the TV one night, and you ended up here working for the ministry. Yeah. You didn't plan that, did you? No, it's a miraculous thing. It's a miraculous thing to be in heavy metal music and a DJ <laughs> and interviewing David Lee Roth. What a fool. <laughs> and, 
and you end up up here. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It really is. But you can plan your life and God directs your steps. Back over here to Romans 9. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runs the race in life, but of God that shows mercy upon Jacob and not on Esau. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose that I have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. It says that over in Exodus, the ninth chapter. He said, I've hardened your heart so I can show my power in you. I want to show my power when I destroy you. Let me ask you how much, how much mercy did God have on Pharaoh when he had his entire army follow Moses down into the Red Sea? How much mercy did he have? Did he love Pharaoh? When he tells Back over here in Exodus. Back in Exodus. Your the Passover's come. And in the twelfth chapter, and God is taking and God's gonna kill all of Pharaoh's he's gonna kill Pharaoh's firstborn. Go over in the twelfth chapter. Twelfth chapter, or actually, yeah, the twelfth chapter. Look at verse 29. God says, whoever doesn't have the blood on the doorposts of their house is going to die. The blood of a, of a lamb, this is a Passover night. When I see the blood, I'll pass over that house. If that house doesn't have the blood around the lentils of the house, of a lamb without blemish, which is a picture of Christ. All the firstborn in that house will die. And in verse 29, it came to pass, at midnight, at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. A lot of them were just innocent children. If they hadn't come to an accountable age, they'd go be with the Lord. That's a good way to get pagans to go be with God, kill their children before that accountable age. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne under the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. What have those cattle done? And he said, I'm going to kill the, if you don't have this blood on the doorpost, then they're going to die. And Pharaoh rose up the night, and he and his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry of Egypt, but there was not a house where there was not one dead. What have they done? Did God love them? Not if they were an accountable age, and they never repented, he didn't love them. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up, and get you forth from among thy people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. And he let him go, and then he changed his mind, and then he changed his mind, and he chases him to the Red Sea. Now, I'm quite sure the Red Sea wasn't two big walls of water, and Pharaoh said, let's go down between those walls of water. The Red Sea was a long See, it was a, here's the Red Sea right there. Part of it goes on up here, but it could have been miles wide, and it could have been a movement of the waters by a great wind, the Bible says. Could have moved it back two miles on each side. And then they had like two to two and a half million of the children of Israel. If they marched them through in ranks of two or three, it would take them two or three days to march through there. They were probably marching through since it was such a wide expanse there. They're marching maybe a mile wide of people marching through. Pharaoh's not going to come up there and say, well, their God is 
put these two walls of water in. Let's ride down through there and see if we can catch them. And it may have been several miles to the other side. He wasn't a fool. It's just that when he got down there, they heard this rumbling and they see these waters coming from a distance. And then, did God love Pharaoh? He said, I wanted to show my power. That's why I put him down in the bottom of the Red Sea and drowned him and then put him in hell. I'm glad I wasn't Pharaoh. I'm so thankful he, he put me in, in the 20th and 21st century. I raised thee up to make my power known. That's what he said. And look here in the 14th chapter. There at the Red Sea. At the Red Sea. Let's read down to this. And he says in verse in verse 17, what he tells Moses in 16th verse, is chapter 14, lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I beheld and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord went before the camp of Israel and moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud that went from before their face stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them but it gave light by night to these, the, the Israel, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out, verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. And all, and all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the middle of the sea. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watched the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. And God took off the chariot wheels that drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel. Notice what they said, For the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians they recognized God was fighting the battle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians, in the middle of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the middle of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them and their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, and Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And the next chapter is the Song of Moses. Now go back over here to Romans. Did God love Pharaoh? No, he didn't love him. He was a vessel of wrath. Now, He has mercy on him, he'll have mercy. And then you say, this is Paul anticipating 
our words. The devil said to them, Why doth he yet find fault if he's fixed men to go to hell? For who hath resisted his will? Even his evil will. Who can resist the will of God? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why have you made me this way? I've felt those words in my life. Lord, why have you given me this voice and I can't get on the top of the world? Hath not the potter power of the clay of the same lump? That word lump is furama, P-H-U-R-A-M-A. P-H-U-R-A-M-A. It's talking about the womb of Rebecca. Of the same lump, it means mixed liquid, solid or swelling in a bulk. It means the bulk of the pregnancy inside of her. Had not the powder power of the clay of the same lump. God is the potter, we are the clay, and we are all the work of his hands. He can do with us as he please. If people ever came to realize that, it would terrify them. To make one vessel an honor, another dishonor. What if God, it doesn't say what if, it just says God willing concerning the vessels of wrath and the vessels of mercy. Now God is willing. Thalo. Same word. Same word as the wind bloweth where it listeth. Where it wills to blow. God wills. It is a form of thelema, T-H-E-L-E-M-A, which is the word in John 1, 13. We're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That word will means to determine. God has determined, thalo, He's determined to show, it doesn't say his wrath. It says tain or gain. People say, why would God send somebody to hell on purpose? Tain, taeta, nu. Or gain, O, R, G, N. Uh, a to N. This is feminine gender. Feminine because the orge is the wrath of covetousness. And that all started at Babel. Babel was the mother of all harlots. Mother is feminine gender. And Babel was founded on self or let us make us a name. You've got two mountains in the scripture. You've got Zion and you've got Babylon. Babylon is a she. She brought about the orge. So God says, I am willing. It is my will to show the wrath, this orge of man. I want him to exhibit his orge so I can make my power known. You don't have to understand that. You just believe it. Power is the word dunamis. God says, I want to show who I am by destroying wicked people. And that's the truth. They don't, people don't get this. It's the exact opposite of the next verse. I want to show my power. I endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. I want to show who I am. God can't show as much who he is. He can show his mercy to us. He can't show his power on us. He wants people to see his power by destroying men in hell. He'll be just as glorified sending evil people to hell as he will by showing us his mercy. 
And that's just all his arbitrary choice. It's what he wants to do. And he says, with much long suffering to the vessels of wrath, fitted to vessels of all gay that are fitted. Catortizo. Fully accomplished to be destroyed. They're fully accomplished because God has turned them over to their own desires and he's not going to redeem them or save them. That's the majority of the world. That's the part that most people don't like. Even a lot of the so-called uh, predestinationist preachers will say, most of the reformers will say, well, he predestined us to conform to his likeness, but he left the rest to himself. He did not. They were born to be destroyed. They had no other purpose in life. I don't believe Bill Gates has any other purpose in history than to make money, and that was it. Do I believe he's going to have it? No siree. People say, well, you're judging. That's right. I'm judging by his fruit, which he doesn't have any. He doesn't have any love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith. It's, he doesn't have that. He's a typical rich man. Woe to you that are rich. You've got your consolation. He knows I wouldn't trade what I know about the Bible for all of his money. I wouldn't trade what I know about baptism for all of his money. He gets to keep that money for about 20 more years. That's about it. It's not his anymore. He's going to die and leave it to his family so they can fight over it. Maybe 25. I don't Read know. Read verse 22 the way it's supposed to be. Okay. God willing to show the orge of mankind and to make his dunamis, his power known, he endured with much long suffering that word macrothemia, that's long-suffering. He endured much long-suffering. The vessels of orgay catortizo fitted to destruction. He's fitted them up to be destroyed. And then he puts the opposite of that in the next verse. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, talking about Jacob. This is talking about Esau and Jacob before they were born, before they had done any good or evil, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared. Afore prepared is the same word as you find in Ephesians 2.10. Same word as Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God hath before ordained. Same word. Same word. Uh, where he that he might make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he hath before prepared, afore prepared, same word, same word as where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, uh, which God hath before ordained. These are the same exact words. Why they translate them this way, I don't know. They're the same word, pro, meaning before, hetoimas, H-E-T-O-I-A-M-A-S. It means to fit up, fit up in advance. God has fitted us up in advance and he's done the same thing to the vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction. 
they don't have a chance of going to heaven. And guess what? They're not going to want to. It's like I told the guy this morning. I hope, this is my desire, I hope God deals you one day to cause you to seek the truth. But that's not up to me. I'd like to see that. That's my flesh opposes, opposes God's will. Now, we got to go over here to Second Peter. Some people have no other purpose, not some of them, all of the vessels of wrath. We're not supposed to go around and talk, calling people vessels of wrath. We've had people come here that did that, get mad at somebody. You're a vessel of wrath. Well, not unless they've been fitted for destruction. Now, this has some of the characters of these people in 2 Peter. All right. In the second chapter, now my Bible's coming apart. All right. Second chapter. Verse, he's talking about godly men in here and he knows how to deliver the godly in verse 9 out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished the unjust are the ones that are not justified by God but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust he's talking about these vessels of wrath in the lust the epithumia To breathe hard after. Epi means a bone. Thumos means to breathe hard. To superimpose breathing hard. I, I, I've got to have that, and I've got to have her, and I've got to have him, and I, I've just got to have what I want. So they are lusting in uncleanness, they despise anyone telling them what to do. The word government is the word kuriates. K-U-R-I-O-T-E-S. It's a form of kurios, which is the word Lord. They don't want anyone telling them what to do, especially God or some preacher preaching at them. They don't want that. They despise being governed. Presumptuous are they. They presume to have everything together. Self-willed. They're not free-willed. They are self-willed. They're just out to fulfill their own desires. Self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, which would be people that are in charge, the preacher particularly. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord. But these people who are presumptuous, they're unclean, they despise being governed. There are people that have come into the church like that. But these as natural brute beasts, brute, allogos, comes from logos, which is the word word, and the alpha privilege negates that. It means no word of God, no Holy Spirit, no blood baptism, no fiery trial, no fire, no trials. They're actually reprobate. Well, they may not be reprobate. You have to be a believer to be reprobate. Adokimos means no fire. That That's a man that usually has fallen away. But we're talking about these people had no purpose for being born but to go to hell. 
That was their purpose. Well, that's what it says. These as natural brute beasts. The Old Testament word for brute is ba'ar. Those who despise reproof and correction, they are brutish. They have the understanding of a brute animal that cannot learn. They are stupid. Stupid is worse than ignorant. Ignorant, you can teach somebody. That means unlearned. Stupid is permanent. They do not have the ability to learn. They are dull of hearing. That's what the word brutish means. It means dull of hearing or stupid. When you look it up, it'll say stupid in any of your concordances. They're stupid people. They cannot learn. That's what I believe person like Kenneth Copeland is, I believe he is stupid. And then it says, they're natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Made is the word ganeo, G-E-N-N-A-O. G-E-N-N-A-O. It means born. They were born to go to hell. I can't, you can't convince anybody this is the majority of the world. This is the many, the many. It, we get the word G-E-N-N-E-S-I-S, -E -E which is the word nativity from Ganeo. It means birthed, and it comes from our word gene. That's, that's your genes. You're, these people who are presumptuous, they were born. The only purpose of them being born was to go to hell. Reminded me of that song that came on the radio today, that Bohemian Rhapsody. And he says in the middle of it, I wish I'd never been born. That's, he probably went to hell when he died of AIDS. Yeah. He says, wish I'd never been born. They were born to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of things that they understand not. When they put me down for Somebody told Tim, a guy who went for us, said, Jim Brown's still a legalist. You, legal means lawful. You mean I'm, you do, do you, are you a legalist? You, can you break the law of God? Can you go out and rob banks and curse and, and kill people? Yeah, I'm a legalist. I don't believe you're saved by the law, but I believe you're obedient to God, and he'll beat you with an inch of your life if you're not obedient. You can't go out and steal cars and rob banks, can you? And curse, and tell dirty jokes. You can't do that. You got to get over that. And they speak evil of things they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And shall this is still talking about these guys and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they sit down at grace and truth ministries and feast with you. We've had some in here. I don't know who is and who isn't, but I'm quite sure we've had some as we're at the love feast, these same people, read on with me. These are people, and God says, I hate them. Having eyes full of adultery, they cannot cease from sin. They walk out the door, and they practice everything they used to practice, and they talk a good talk while they're here, but they don't walk the walk. Beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous pleonectes, 
that's meaning to want more by avarice or extortion, however they can get it. Cursed children, we're talking about these natural brute beasts. And they're going to hell. And God hates them. Which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with a man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are, these men are wells without living water, clouds that are carried about with a tempest, of whom the mist of darkness is reserved for ever. They were made to be gone. They were born to go to this place. They're vessels of wrath. God hates every one of these people. He made them so he could hate them. And he made them without any, without any redemption and made them what they are so he could put them in hell, so he could show his power and make it known upon these vessels of wrath. And when they speak great swelling words of vanity, Metiotes, the word vanity. It means empty. Great swelling words. They just... Fathangomai is the word. Words. They talk big. It's big talk. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. They lead people away in the middle of the church. They are, one of the words for evil, erethea, means to a faction that stands on the side and talks about the preacher and tries to run the preacher down. While they promise them liberty, that's what they're promising people in the church, come and follow me and we'll start our own church. They themselves are servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. If you listen to gossip, somebody will drag you away. And we've had so many people leave here. One group started meeting up in Gallatin in somebody's apartment. They lasted about a month and they were all going, just taking off, going all kinds of directions. God does it. Uh, what does it? God does it. Oh, I know that. Now, you have two different people here. you got the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and the righteous who are being led away. Then he says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he's talking about these that are being led away because you got the vessels of wrath that are leading them away. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned again to his own vomit again. Believers are never called dogs. The dogs were the Gentiles, the unbelievers. This is talking about these vessels of wrath turn people away, and then they go back to their own vomit, and they've partaken of the truth. And the sow, believers are never called pigs. We were lambs. Lambs going astray. And the sow was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So that's talking about the dogs and the sows are unbelievers. They're vessels of wrath that lead people away into error. Do we have any time, Mike? Three. Three minutes. I've got so many things on this. I wanted to help everybody to see that God creates evil for evil's sake. He wants the evil to happen so that people could understand his power. He can't, you can't see the power of God that's just like in John 10. In John 10, they said, 
How long wilt thou make us to doubt if thou be the Christ? Tell us plainly. The Pharisees said to Jesus, he said, you will not believe you're not of my sheep, you're goats. Get away from me. I hate you. That's what he was saying in essence. Anybody else who wanted to know the truth that was approaching him in a gentle, quiet, humble manner, he would, he would meet their need. But these guys were hypocrites. He said, you will not believe you're not of my sheep. I hate you. Get away from me. One of my favorite verses about why people can't believe God fixes their mind so they can't believe it was over there in John 8 when he says tells them why they can't believe in John 8 he says verse 47 he that is of God heareth God's words ye therefore hear them not because you are not of God that's why you can't hear John says something similar to that in 3 John. He says in verse 11, 3 John, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth good, agatho poeo, he that does the beautiful, beautiful things of God is of God. But he that doeth evil hath not seen God. God doesn't like, he hates. Then in Psalms 5 and 5, God hates all workers of iniquity. He doesn't just dismiss them and, well, I don't kind of like you a little bit. He hates them. He hates. David said, Lord, let me hate those that, hate those that you hate with a perfect hatred but David also said he had to be taught to do that because it's the nature of man to want to get along with the world that hates God I'm out of time here I've got a lot of other verses on this uh, he does what he wants he sits in the heavens he creates evil for his own glory that's why he did it from the beginning. Uh, he knocked down Paul with a great light, and he didn't ask Paul, would you like to accept me? Would you like to pray a prayer and ask me to come into your heart? He struck him down and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He called him and converted him instantly by knocking him down off his horse or whatever he's riding, his camel. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to understand that you're in charge of everything, including the evil. Lord, open the eyes of some of these people that claim to believe in predestination, but they don't believe the evil comes from you. You created evil and created sin so you could hate it. You wouldn't have mercy otherwise. Thank you for truth fight our battles. We'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. I got your deal in the car. Oh, okay. I meant to bring it in. Let me go get it. Okay, you won't. You. you won't have to sit around and wait for me to. I gotta go get something to eat. Get something to eat. Yeah, I'm on a schedule of eating. You're on a schedule. Yeah. How's How's your stomach doing? Uh, it's doing better. It's gradually getting better. Man, I'm glad I'm to hear that. Hoping that it'll just continue. That tickles me to death hear that.